All right, we will get started for real now. Um, so in addition to the announcement we just had from, from Zach, uh, or his associate, uh, whatever the guy's name was, I forget already. Um, so in addition to that, there's, I've been asked to pass along an announcement about an AMSA meeting, uh, which I guess is not until next week, uh, but that's going to be Tuesday at 6.30. And this was what we just heard about if you, if you were here a little bit early, um, the opportunity to participate in a research study that would earn you $20 or possibly $500. There's also an email address listed here, so if you prefer to just email them, that seems more efficient than texting or email address, but what do I know about technology? So you can email them directly as well. Um, all right, and then as um, as you're aware, most I think probably most of you have uh, taken the exam already. The problem, I'm sure some of your comrades are currently doing that or about to do it, and that'll wrap it up tonight. Um, so we'll on a Monday, I'll have sort of a summary of the results, how everything went. Um, because as you guys know, the um, you know the drop deadline is is approaching. So you know with two exams under our belt, we kind of have a better sense for how things are going. Um, and if you need to discuss your results with me on this exam or you're standing in the class, I'm happy to do that uh, in my office, either regular office hours or an appointment outside of that. So please let me know if, you, if you're interested in that. Um, the, the exam results should be available tonight around 8 p.m. once everybody's finished taking it. Um, so you can go on to Blackboard and see which questions uh, you may have missed and see if there's any issues with those. Um, if you have a regrade request for some reason, either that the, you think the problem was created, graded incorrectly or, or uh, was unfair for some reason, um, not likely that you'll get points back, but certainly possible. And if you want to do that, you need to uh, tell me about that within a week. So by, by the middle of next week is when I'll be, you know, around Wednesday or Thursday is when you'll have to submit those requests. But I'm happy to go over the results with anybody. And again, the more, you know, big picture uh, things about how you're doing in the class are important now, especially as the drop deadline gets, gets close, so uh, please contact me if you want to talk about that. All right, so what we're going to do today is continue on with topics related to Chapter 7, which is energy and enthalpy, um, and we'll mostly finish the topics in that chapter, although there's one that we're going to circle back to next week that was officially a Chapter 3 topic, but is more appropriate for this section of the course, so we'll um, cover that as well on Monday. But today we're going to continue on with calorimetry. So last time we learned how we can use a calorimeter, which is a device for measuring heat, and that allows us to do a few different things, primarily measuring heat capacities or uh, measuring enthalpy or energy changes for chemical reactions. Um, we're going to see one other type today, which is a constant volume calorimeter. Uh, from a technological standpoint, this is a little bit different, a little bit more advanced than the constant pressure calorimeters that we introduced last time, but it really doesn't have anything different in terms of how you treat the problem. So the types of you know analysis we have to do, uh, types of problems we have to do are really basically identical for these. I just want to give you a little bit of information about the differences between constant volume and constant pressure. So another name for constant volume calorimeter is bomb calorimeter. Um, now they're actually designed not to explode, but they, um, they're called bomb calorimeters because they are rigid sealed containers, so they do allow pressure to build up inside of them, so that's the difference. Constant pressure calorimeters are vented so that the pressure stays the same the whole time, typically atmospheric pressure, but then a bomb calorimeter is totally enclosed, totally sealed, so if there is pressure building up during the reaction, either because of the large amount of heat that's evolved or because a gas has evolved, that pressure will build up in one of these calorimeters. So it's called a bomb calorimeter for that reason, but um, what are the advantages of it? So one is that it can be used with uh, reactions that involve gases. So as we said, if you have, if you're doing a reaction in a constant pressure calorimeter, which is vented, um, especially if one of your reactants is a gas, that's you know no good for you because the gas is just going to escape from the calorimeter. Or even if you evolve a gas as a product, you're going to possibly lose a lot of heat from that gas as it as it escapes from the calorimeter. But in a constant volume calorimeter, whether you have reactants or products that are gases, you can do that in there because it's a, a totally sealed container. Um, the other thing that it does, although we usually again use these interchangeably, is that it measures delta E directly. So don't let this point necessarily drive you too crazy because it's not that important. But because as I said, we well, typically use delta E and delta H interchangeably in these contexts of measuring. Uh, energy changes for chemical reactions, but technically speaking, when you do it in a constant volume calorimeter, you are measuring delta E, and the reason is because, as we'll see, when you have a constant volume, you have no work term to worry about, so the heat and the delta E are basically the same thing. Um, but, the, but another advantage of constant volume calorimeter is that 
from a technical standpoint, it doesn't really affect you guys in a, in a lecture course, but if you're doing this, these things experimentally, for a constant volume calorimeter, you can know the heat capacity of the calorimeter much more precisely. And that, again, is because it's a totally sealed container, so you don't have to worry about any amount of heat that's escaping during the, during the measurement. It's totally sealed, totally enclosed, so they're, they're typically a lot better insulated, um, and you can know that heat capacity a lot more precisely than is possible with constant volume. So basically, if you, or sorry, constant pressure. If you want to know sort of the gross level differences between these, the constant pressure calorimeter that we introduced last time is kind of the, you know, the low level Mickey Mouse calorimeter, and this is sort of the more high tech fancy one that you would use if you were doing sort of real type of research on this type of stuff. But they're both, they're both useful in their own context. So the equations are essentially the same as last time. Though. So we learned that delta E is equal to Q plus W, which we can rewrite as Q minus P delta V. So we learned that for expansion work, work is equal to negative pressure times change in volume. In a constant volume calorimeter, we know that delta V is equal to zero, which means that this whole term is equal to zero also. So when you're doing a reaction in a constant volume calorimeter, you don't have any expansion work happening because you don't have any change in volume delta V. So that means if you measure heat at constant volume, that will give you a delta E directly because you don't have a work term anymore to worry about. So that's, as I said, is one of the advantages of, of, of a, or one of the differences, I suppose, not necessarily an advantage, of a bomb calorimeter is that you measure delta E in that way. In terms of how we treat the data that we get from these calorimeters and, and the types of problems that we'll do in this class, it's really exactly the same as what we saw last time. So the negative of your reaction heat, the heat from the reaction, is equal to the heat of the calorimeter. So again, the, the heat that you measure in the calorimeter and the heat from the reaction are equal in magnitude, opposite in sign, exactly what we saw last time. And the heat that we measure for the calorimeter is a sum of mass of the water in the calorimeter, heat capacity of the water, and the change in temperature, plus the overall heat capacity of the calorimeter itself, absent the water, times delta T. And like I said, the problems that you see on the homework assignments and exams You'll sometimes have to account for both of these terms. Sometimes, depending on what we give you, you'll only worry about the water or only worry about the calorimeter. So let's do one quick example with that then. Um, so the, a common way that you use these bomb calorimeters is, is to figure out how much energy is released when you burn a substance. So in this case, we're measuring the energy content of a, of a fuel octane, or you can, if, when they measure calorie contents in food, this is often how they do it also. They burn it inside a calorimeter and measure how much energy is released when you burn it. So here we have a 3.45 gram sample of octane. Octane is one of the major components of gasoline. We burn it in a constant volume calorimeter with a heat capacity of 9.121 kilojoules per Kelvin. If the temperature rises to 17.7 Celsius, what is the combustion enthalpy of octane in kilojoules per mole? All right, so again, there's going to be a few steps that we need to get here. In this problem, the first thing we can do is calculate the heat for the calorimeter, QCal, as I abbreviate it. And as we said, it's going to be a sum of the amount of water in the calorimeter, mass times C times delta T, and then also the heat capacity of the calorimeter itself times delta T. Do we know how much water is in this calorimeter? Is, am I telling you that here? No. So a common mistake that people make that I want you to be aware of is a lot of people will try to use this mass in the MC delta T equation. Remember, MC delta T for the calorimeter is the mass of water in the calorimeter not the mass of the substance that you're reacting. So we want to, in this case, we don't know how much water is in the calorimeter, so we're just going to say that the heat is just the heat capacity of the calorimeter times delta T. Or in other words, this number here, 9.2121, likely includes both the heat capacity of the calorimeter itself and the water inside it all grouped into ones. So this is one way that we can approach these problems and, and, approach, and use this information. So we just need the one term here, and this time we don't have to worry about mass of substance at all because we just have an overall heat capacity of 9.121 kilojoules per Kelvin. We notice the unit doesn't even have mass in it anymore. And when you have to multiply that by the change in temperature, it rises 17.7 Celsius. So that's going to be equivalent to a delta T of 17.7 Celsius or 17.7 Kelvin. And what we get is 161.4 kilojoules. All right. So again, being careful with units here, this is kilojoules per Kelvin. So the heat that we calculate will be kilojoules directly. All right, so that's the heat for the calorimeter. We know that then the heat for the reaction, which is in this case burning octane, is going to be the negative of that. And so what we have is 
minus 161.4. So we just take the negative of that. Now keep in mind though that what we're looking for in this problem is the combustion enthalpy in kilojoules per mole. This amount of heat here that we measured in the calorimeter is, this, this is delta H or delta E, but it re refers to burning 3.45 grams of octane, the amount that we actually measured and, and burned inside the calorimeter. What we want to know is what is the enthalpy change delta H per mole. And that's what we're really looking for here. So as I said last time, there's usually going to be a last step where this heat of reaction represents the amount of heat that's generated when we burn some set amount of substance. We want to normalize that per mole of substance to make it a more useful quantity. So the combustion enthalpy is going to be the heat of reaction divided by the moles of C8H10, which is octane. So the heat of reaction is minus 161.4 kilojoules, and we just have to divide that by moles of substance. So the moles of substance that we burn, we have 3.45 grams, and so we get the moles of that by using molar mass. So we have 3.45 grams of C8H10, and the molar mass is 116. So we convert to moles like we always do by dividing by molar mass. So what we have is 0 0.0297 moles of C8H10. So we divide the heat of the reaction by the moles of substance to get kilojoules per mole. And this comes out to a pretty big number, as is usually the case for combustion enthalpies. A lot of these hydrocarbons release a lot of energy when they're burned. So, sorry, wrong number. 5.42 times 10 to the third kilojoules per mole in scientific notation. Now, I also want you to be a little bit aware of two of... Um, you know, the sign of this is negative. Burning something is exothermic, so delta H is negative. Sometimes people report combustion enthalpies as positive numbers because when you combust or burn something, it's always exothermic, so reporting a negative number is kind of implied in that case. So if you see, you know, answer choices on a homework assignment or test where you have a combustion enthalpy that's positive, like don't, be, don't flip out about that. We're not going to play sign games on you. We'll either give you all positive or all negative answer choices. Just pick the one that's the right magnitude because, again, combustion enthalpy is sometimes given as a positive number just saying, the amount of heat that's released when something burns, because whenever something burns, it's going to be negative delta H that's sort of implied. So don't be confused by that, but technically speaking, it is a negative delta H because it's exothermic, releasing heat to the surroundings. All right, so any questions on this or calorimetry in general, because we are going to move on from it now. All right, so what we're going to do now is, this is going to seem unconnected, but we're going to see why this is important here in a second. So we've learned now how to measure delta H in a laboratory using calorimetry. Um, the other thing that we often do in chemistry, though, is not necessarily go in the lab and measure delta H every time we want to do a new reaction, but we use other known chemical reactions with known delta H values, and we combine them in different ways to find the delta H of a new reaction. So in order to do that, we have to learn how to, how to combine chemical reactions, or what are called consecutive reactions, which would be reactions that sort of happen in sequence. Um, so we're going to sort of, this is going to seem unconnected, as I said, but let's learn this uh, approach first and then see how it relates to delta H here in a little bit. So if we have two reactions that are happening in sequence or two different chemical reactions that we want to combine into one, mathematical equations we know can be, can be added. So if, if, you know, if you remember from your algebra and pre-calculus classes when you were solving systems of equations, often you took two equations and combined them by adding each side on, on other sides of the equal sign. You can do the same thing for chemical equations. So the reactants and products add together. So let's say we have two chemical equations in very generic format, 3A plus 2B going to 4C for one of them, and then let's say the second equation has 4C plus D going to 3E. What we do when we add together chemical equations is that just everything on the left side of the arrow gets added together in the combined equation, everything on the right side of the arrow gets added together in the combined equation. So we have 3A plus 2B on the left side from the first equation. We have 4C and D from the left side on the second equation. So we just combine all of those on the left side of the arrow, and then the right side of the arrow has the two products, 4C plus 3E. So it's exactly like adding together mathematical equations. Everything on one side of the arrow or one side of the equal sign gets added together. Everything on the other side of the equal sign, the other side of the arrow, also gets added together. 
Now, what we learned a little bit when we were talking with uh, dealing with ionic equations is that if you have the same thing on both sides of the reaction arrow, you can cancel it out because if you have one thing as a reactant and one thing as a product, there's no net change involving that substance, so you can get rid of it. So we see that in this equation here, we have 4C as a reactant, 4C as a product, so we can cancel those out. So anytime you have the same thing on both sides, it can be canceled. And so our combined equation would now be simplified to 3A plus 2B plus D going to 3E, which is the only product left. So we get rid of that 4C because it appears on both sides. So the same thing is true as we saw for net ionic equations. Now when we combine two or more equations, you can also do that. And, and the thing that we canceled out is what's referred to as an intermediate. So when we have consecutive reactions, where we're doing two different reactions and then trying to combine them into one, as we did here, the intermediate is something that appears on both sides. So it, it's something that forms as a product in one reaction. So we saw that 4C formed as a product in the first reaction. and then is consumed in a subsequent reaction. We will sometimes deal with sequences of more than two reactions, so it doesn't necessarily have to be the next reaction in the sequence, but it will be a subsequent reaction that happens after that. So we see in this example that I gave you, 4C was formed in the first equation, and then 4C was consumed, used as a reactant in the second equation. So C in this case, substance C, whatever that is, would be the intermediate in this example. All right. So this consecutive reaction thing is going to be something you'll also see if you take Chem 2. So we're going to, you know, we're going to use it in this class in the context of delta H. We'll use it in other contexts in chemistry too. So it's a, it's a common thing that we do in chemistry when analyzing complex chemical reactions. All right. So that's how it, how it sort of looks in abstract. So let's look at this in a little bit more detail now. So what we're often going to have to do in this part of the course is we're going to give you two chemical equations and you have to combine them into one. Um, and so what we end up, what we have to do then is write out the individual steps. So each individual step that you're combining, each individual equation, um, it should be a balanced equation on its own. So you have to make sure that each of the equations that you're combining is itself balanced. You can't combine unbalanced equations. That causes big problems. So let's say we had the first equation was sulfuric acid, H2SO4, reacting with sodium chloride. And I'll just put the coefficients in, but you do have to make sure, of course, that these have the correct coefficients. Typically, for these types of problems, we'll give you balanced equations. We're not going to have you balance and then combine them, but you do have to make sure they're balanced. So let's say that this is our first chemical equation. And then in a the second step, we're going to use the HCl and do another reaction with that. So we're going to take the HCl and combine it with iron to make iron chloride. So these are the two individual equations that we have that we want to be able to add together into one combined chemical equation. The next step is, in many cases, we're going to have to adjust the coefficients to make sure that our intermediate cancels out. Because in order for an intermediate to cancel out, it not only has to appear on both sides of the arrow, but it also has to have the same coefficients on both sides of the arrow. So we're going to adjust coefficients to ensure that intermediates cancel. So if you look at these two equations, as I kind of already alluded to, we're forming HCl in the first equation. We're consuming it as a reactant in the second equation. So HCl is our intermediate, but you see that the coefficients are not the same. We have a coefficient of 2 for HCl in the first one a coefficient of 6 for the second one. So to make sure that those end up canceling, we have to take this first equation and multiply every coefficient by 3. All right, so if we multiply every coefficient by 3, we're going to now have 6 HCLs on the product side here, 6 HCLs on the reactant side for the second one, and they will cancel out. So we're going to take this first equation, multiply it by 3, and we have to do that for every single coefficient. We can't just change one coefficient because that will unbalance the equation. So by itself, this won't be a simplified equation because it will have reducible coefficients, but it will make sure that our intermediate gets canceled out when we add the two together. Okay, So that's our adjusted equation, and then once we have adjusted the coefficients appropriately, we can add them all together. So we're going to take this equation and this one and combine the two to, to, to each other.
All right, so what we end up with is on the reaction side from this equation, we have two irons and six HCLs. From this modified equation here that we just modified, we have three H2SO4. Doesn't really matter what order you do this in, I'm sort of doing it in the opposite order. And six NaCl. And then on the product side from this first one here, we have two FeCl3. 3H2, and then from the second one we have 6HCl, and out of room, but 3 sodium sulfates. All right, so those are all the reactants and products from the two equations, and then we find the one that cancels out. If we did our job correctly, we said that HCl would cancel out. We have 6HCl there, 6HCl on the product side, so those cancel, and that leaves us with this equation. 2Fe plus 3H2SO4 plus 6NaCl going to 2. So we just, whatever's left, we just take that and that's going to be our combined chemical equation. And now we see that in this combined equation, the coefficients are completely reduced. We can't reduce them any further and our intermediate HCl is no longer there as it should be. So when you combine chemical equations, you have to make sure that you adjust the coefficients in many cases to ensure that the intermediates that are there that you don't want in your overall equation cancel out. All right, so let's do just one more example with, uh, of, of this. So we have POCl3 is a common reagent in organic synthesis. It can be prepared in two steps. So in the first step, we take elemental phosphorus, P4, with chlorine to make PCL5. And then the second step, the PCL5 is reacted with water to produce POCl3 and HCl. So in this case, we have to actually write out the two equations. We didn't give them to you directly. So again, at times, you will have to, to write those out. So the two equations, the first step is going to be, as we said, P4. We want to combine these two steps into one. So P4 plus... Cl2s are the reactants, phosphorus and chlorine, to make PCl5. And then if we want to balance this with whole numbers, what we have to do is we have four phosphoruses, that makes four PCl5. Now we have 20 chlorine, so we have to put a 10 there. Okay, so those are the coefficients for the first step. And then the second step is we take PCl5 and react it with water, H2O, which is what we say is hydrolyzed, to make the product we're interested in, POCl3, and HCl is a byproduct. And then to balance this equation, we see that we have PCl5, H2O, and we should need a, just a 2 there to balance it. So two HCls formed to make sure that chlorine and hydrogen are both balanced. All right, so those are the two equations. And then if we want to combine the two, again, we have to make sure the intermediates cancel out. In the first equation, we're forming four PCl5s. In the second equation, we just have one PCl5, so we need to take this whole second equation and multiply it by four. All right, so the modified second equation is gonna be four PCl5 plus four H2O. Remember, we have to multiply every single coefficient by four, not just the one that we need to adjust. So that's the modified second equation, then we're gonna add that to this first equation here. So these two are gonna get added, we end up with P4 plus 10 Cl2s. We have four PCL5, but that's going to cancel out with the four PCL5 over here, so that's our intermediate, so we can cancel it. And then we also have, I think I missed something up. I forgot my arrow here. There we go. Four H2O. So that's everything on the reactant side. And then the product side, we said that PCL5 cancels out, and we're left with 4POCL3 plus 8HCl. Now, these examples kind of give you the idea of sort of the mechanics of adding equations together and how we can sometimes adjust coefficients and make sure that intermediates cancel. Usually, what it's going to be given to you, as we'll see, is you're going to have a chemical equation that you're targeting. We say, you know, that what's the delta H for this reaction? And you're going to have to figure out how to add together two or more other chemical equations to get that reaction that you're interested in. So we're going to see examples of that as we go through this. But this gives you an idea of, of sort of the steps involved in, in, in that approach.
So now let's move on to see exactly how we use this in the context of delta H. So we have to talk a little bit about the properties of delta H and how it relates then to coefficients and balanced equations. All right, so we already saw, this is sort of a review now, that delta H can be positive or negative, and that depends on whether the reaction is exothermic or endothermic. So we can have both positive and negative delta H's, exothermic and or endothermic. All right, so that's the definitions that we covered last time. Now, the other thing that's important to think about as we get into this is what is true about the magnitude of delta H. We've kind of already addressed this in calorimetry problems, which is that the delta H is going to be proportional to the amount of substance that we're using in the chemical reaction. All right, so let's see how this works then a little bit in practice. So what we call a thermochemical equation is going to be a chemical equation with its delta H right next to it. So if we take water and decompose it into its elements, hydrogen and oxygen, if we write the equation like this, let's say we're doing the decomposition of one mole of water to make, sorry, one mole of H2 and one half mole of O2. So if we have this chemical equation, a thermochemical equation would also then include delta H. So delta H for this reaction is going to be positive 286 kilojoules. So what this means when we write it like this, a thermochemical equation, is that if we take one mole of water and decompose it to one mole of hydrogen and half mole of oxygen, the delta H, the enthalpy change for that process, is 286 kilojoules. So if we produce one mole of hydrogen, as, we're, as is written here, that's going to be delta H. But let's say we're instead producing two moles of hydrogen. The delta H in this case would be, if we have two moles of hydrogen, we know that from the thermochemical equation it's going to be 286 kilojoules for every one mole of hydrogen, right? So this is a coefficient of one in front of H2. So we say that's 286 kilojoules per one mole of H2 which means if we were instead producing two moles of hydrogen, our delta H would be doubled, 572 kilojoules. All right, so whenever you have different amounts of substances involved, the delta H is going to scale appropriately, as we saw here in this simple example. So delta H depends on the amount of substance um, that's involved in the chemical equation, which is something we've already touched on a little bit. Here you see it more written out explicitly as a thermochemical equation. And so when you write a thermochemical equation to reiterate, it, it's, it refers to the exact number of moles of substance that are shown up as coefficients in the equation, okay? So then let's think about what happens if we have a thermochemical equation, a chemical equation and a delta H, what happens if we change the direction of the reaction? All right, so remember that delta H is the enthalpy of the products minus reactants. So if we swap reactants and products and just switch the direction of a reaction, what do we think happens to delta H? It won't change its magnitude, but what it will change is its sign, okay? It'll change, this, it'll change the sign of delta H. All right, so as another example, if we take this, if we take magnesium carbonate and we um, heat it to pretty high temperatures, I'm not sure what this, probably like 800 Celsius or something like that, um, it will decompose to make magnesium oxide and carbon dioxide. And the delta H for this reaction is plus 117 kilojoules, okay? So this is a thermochemical equation for this reaction. But then let's say we instead want to do the opposite process. Let's say we wanted to take magnesium oxide, react it with CO2, and produce magnesium carbonate. So all we've done is just flip the direction of this reaction. We've taken the reactants, or the reactant made it the product. We've made the two products into reactants. We've just flipped the direction of the chemical equation. And without even any math, we can just predict that delta H for this would just be the negative of that, 117 kilojoules. So if we flip the direction of a reaction, all we do to delta H is just flip its sign, okay? So that's simple enough. But then we also saw because delta H scales as amount of substance, is if we change the coefficients in a chemical reaction, 
the delta H will scale by the same amount as the coefficient. All right. All right, so if we have a thermochemical equation here, one mole of magnesium carbonate decomposing to one mole of magnesium oxide, one mole of CO2, delta H is plus 127. If we wanted to write the thermochemical equation that had two MgCO3s decomposing to make two MgO and two CO2, this isn't reduced all the way, but it's still a balanced equation, the delta H for this would be two times this initial delta H because we doubled all the coefficients, okay? So it would be 2 times 117, which is 234 kilojoules. Or sometimes we have to have the coefficients. So, if we're, again, we're going to use these uh, tricks when we do sort of these uh, com combinations of equations. So, so we had to have the coefficients and instead had 1 half MgCO3 going to 1 half MgO and 1 half CO2. Again, a non-standard way of writing a chemical equation, but we can figure out the delta H for this easily because it's just going to be one half times the original delta H. We've taken all the coefficients, multiply them by half, we would also then multiply delta H by one half. All right? So if we have a thermochemical equation, if we do anything to that equation, either flip it, change the coefficients, or some combination of those two, we can very easily figure out what the new delta H is uh, for that modified chemical equation. So that's important to consider as well for this approach. So what this leads us to then is a, a law called Hess's Law, which is we've now learned how to add together chemical equations. We've now learned some things about delta H as we adjust coefficients and change chemical equations. So in the situation where we add multiple chemical equations, multiple thermochemical equations where we have the delta H values, the delta H's are also additive. So if we're combining two or more chemical equations and we want to know the delta H of the combined equation, we just add the delta H values. All right? So our overall delta H, total delta H, is just going to be the delta H of the first equation that we add together plus the delta H of the second equation that we're adding plus the third and so on, however many we have. Okay? So delta H is our additive when we're talking about com combining chemical equations as we're, as we're learning how to do today. Okay, so if we take one equation, which is the one that I gave you uh, on the last slide, magnesium carbonate going to magnesium oxide and CO2, we saw that the delta H is plus 117 kilojoules. This is one of our thermochemical equations. And then let's say we want to take the CO2 that we generate from this and do another reaction with that, combine it with hydrogen to make methanol. We would give you then that the delta H of this is going to be minus 131 kilojoules. And so if we add the two equations together, we see that when we add the two equations, CO2 cancels out as an intermediate. It's formed as a product here. It's a reactant here. So what we're left with is magnesium carbonate plus three hydrogens. This reactant CO2 cancels out with this product CO2. And then on the product side, what we're left with is MgO plus methanol CH4O, okay? So if we want to find what's the delta H for this reaction here, what we have to do is just add the two delta H's that we combined the equations of, okay? So we're going to do delta H then would be the overall or total delta H would be the first one, delta H1, plus the second one, delta H2, which is just 117 kilojoules, plus negative 131 kilojoules, so we can't get... Uh, mess up with signs here, and we get minus 14 kilojoules, okay? So this reaction here of taking magnesium carbonate and adding hydrogen to make magnesium oxide and methanol is exothermic by minus 14 kilojoules, and we determine that by taking two other delta H's and combining them. So this is what's referred to as Hess's Law, the idea that delta H's are additive when we combine two or more chemical equations. All right, so any questions on that concept before we look at a few example problems? All right, so let's go into them then. So the simplest ones would have just two equations. Um, so let's say we want to determine the dimerization of NO2 uh, to make N2O4. So relatively simple reaction. Two NO2s dimerizing to make N2O4. So just one reactant, one product. 
and we're going to use these given delta H values to try to determine what our unknown delta H is. So the problem solving strategy that you have to follow in these is what we're, what we're going to do is we have an equation that we're interested in finding delta H for. We have to figure out how do we combine these two equations down here to get this equation up here. Okay? So we know the delta H for both of these. So we're going to use, again, Hess's law to combine these two equations in some way and then figure out what delta H for this. Now, we can't just add these two together because if we just add these two together as they're given, they're not going to add up to give our overall equation that we want. So we have to figure out how to modify them. So what you want to do in this is you look at your equation that you're interested in up here, and we see that we have two NO2s as a reactant, okay? And we want to find out which of these two equations has NO2 in it, one or both of them. We see that NO2 only appears in the first equation here, but we have one NO2 as a product. What we want is two NO2s as a reactant. So how do we modify this equation here to get two NO2s onto the reactant side? What do we do to it? We flip it and, and double it, good. So we're gonna take this first equation, flip it and double it. That's equivalent to multiplying it by minus two if you wanna think about it mathematically. So for this first equation, we're gonna flip it. So we're gonna move this reactant to the product side and the two reactant, sorry, this product to the reactant side and vice versa. And that gives us two NO2s. So we're gonna flip it and double it. Going to one half N2 gets doubled to one N2. One O2 gets doubled to two O2s. All right, so we flip this, we flip the direction of the reaction, changing reactions and products, and we double all the coefficients. And then the delta H would be, of this modified equation, minus two times the original delta H. Because if we flip it, we flip the sign, so it becomes negative. If we double the coefficients, we double the magnitude, so we're gonna do both of those in this case. So that new delta H is minus 68 kilojoules. It's negative two times the original delta H. For the second equation here, what we want is one N2O4 on the product side, and we see that our second equation already has N2O4 on the product side. So we don't have to do anything to our second equation because we already have N2O4 on the product side with a coefficient of one, which is exactly what we want for the equation we're trying to find. Okay, so we, we, so we don't do anything to the, mod we don't have to modify the second equation. So in many cases, you won't have to modify all of them, just some of them, as we did here. And so what we get is, we just write that out exactly as is given to us, N2 plus 2O2s going to N2O4, and the delta H stays the same because we didn't do anything to it, plus 10 kilojoules. And then what we want to do is we want to verify that when we add these two equations together, they generate this equation here. So we have two N2Os on the, sorry, NO2s on the, I think I keep saying N2O, and I'm not dyslexic, I promise, I just can't talk today. Um, so two NO2s on the reactant side, and then um, we see that N2s here on the reactant side, but it cancels out with the N2 that's on the product side for this equation. Two O2s as reactants, canceling out two O2s as products. So if we do this correctly, all of the intermediates, the species that don't appear in this equation, will cancel out, and they do. So N2 cancels with that N2, two O2s cancels with that two O2s that's on the opposite side of the arrow, and the only thing that's left on the product side is N2O4. So we've successfully reproduced the equation we're interested in, and then the delta H is just going to be this value here, so minus 2 delta H1 plus delta H2, which is negative 68 kilojoules plus 10 kilojoules, which is minus 58 kilojoules, okay? So that was an example with two equations where we had to figure out how to add the two together. Now, I know we're not, you know, you might not think, after, especially after this week, that we're particularly nice when it comes to giving you test questions, but I can promise you that we're not going to give you one where you are unable to add the equations together to get the overall equation. It will be possible, so it's good to verify that it is possible, but we're not going to give you one where there's no way out of it. So trust yourself to be able to do this, and as I said, you know, many, many times already, make sure you practice this enough to get the hang of it. So we'll do one more example together, which is now three equations. In... 99% of the problems will give you the three equations is the most you'll have to deal with, so it's not going to get any more complicated than this. So this time what we want is 2 carbon plus H2 to make C2H2. We want to figure out the delta H for that. And so again, the strategy is to look at reactants and products. We don't necessarily have to go in any particular order and figure out where they appear in these given equations down here. Because again, for these three equations, we know not only the equation, but we also know the delta H. Those are going to be the three that we want to figure out how to combine 
in order to get this equation up here and then solve what the delta H is. All right, so like I said, we can go in any order we want to. If we just look at the first reactant here is two carbons, two C, and we, 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 want, we want to find uh, situations where the reactant or product only appears in one of these two. If the reactant or product appears in more than one of these, we don't want to use that as sort of our starting point or our basis because there's you know, many ways we can combine those. We want to try to find situations where a reactant or product only appears once down here, and we see that carbon, 2C, is one of our reactants. We only have carbon as a reactant in this equation here. None of the other equations have carbon by itself in it. So what we mean that, so what that means then is we're going to take the second equation, we'll, we'll label these as 1, 2, and 3 to keep them numbered. This second equation, we're going to have to double it, right? If we double the second equation, we now get a coefficient of 2 in front of carbon, which is what we want in the equation that we're trying to solve for, okay? So 2 times the second equation. Again, we could do these in many different orders. But if we double that second equation, we get 2 C's plus 2 O2's going to 2 CO2. The delta H would then be 2 times the second delta H. So that's going to be 2 times this number here which is minus 787 kilojoules. All right, so we've modified the second equation, double the delta H. Going back to the equation we're, we're interested in, we have H2 as a reactant, and hydrogen H2 only appears here in equation 3. It's already a reactant in equation 3, and it already has a coefficient of 1, so we're not going to modify that one at all. So we're going to take equation 3 exactly as written, and that will give us 1H2 on the reactant side, which is what we want in our overall equation. So the, the third equation is H2 plus 1 half O2 going to H2O. And the delta H is just the same as the third delta H, no modification necessary, minus 285.8. All right, and then finally, I figured out what to do to get C2H2 on the product side. So neither of these equations that we've already used have C2H2, but we see that we have C2H2 as a reactant in equation 1. We want it as a product in our overall equation, so what are we going to do to equation one? We're going to flip it, okay? So we're going to take the negative of the first equation, the inverse of the first equation, I guess is a better way to say it. And so what we end up with is two CO2s plus H2O on the reactant side. So we take the products and make them into reactants. And then our new products are going to be C2H2 and 5 halves O2. And then delta H for this modified equation is just the negative of the first delta H, which will be 1299.5. So now we're ready to add all of these together and make sure, again, that the equations add up properly. And then once we know that the equations add up properly, we just add numerically the delta H values that we've modified. All right, so we end up with two carbons as a reactant. O2 is a little bit tricky. So we have two O2 here. We have one half O2 in the second equation, so that's two and a half O2s as reactants. But in this last equation here that we modified, we have also two and a half O2s as a product. So they don't cancel out as easily as before, but in total we have two and a half O2s on the left side. We have two and a half O2s on the right side of the arrow, so they cancel out. We have H2, which doesn't cancel with anything, which is what, what should be the case. And then we have two CO2s here on the reactant side, but those are going to cancel out with those two, so CO2 cancels out. We have H2O on the reactant side, but that's going to cancel out with H2O over there. So I'm not writing out the full set of reactants and products and canceling them, just sort of going through uh, a little bit of a shortcut method. So all that's left as reactants is 2C and H2. All that's left on the product side is C2H2. The rest have canceled out from reactants and other equations. So that's the equation that we want, and then the delta H is just going to be the sum of these. So we have minus 787 plus negative 285.8 plus 1299.5 so this, the three delta H values we're just adding to numerically and we get a positive 226.7 okay all right so that was an example with three chemical equations which is I would say in general as, as complex as they will get so any questions on how we approached that one um, or got the answer? Yes? One's 5 over 2. So 5 over 2 is 2.5. And then on the, on the left side, we have 2 plus 1 half, which is also 2.5. Yes. Okay. Any other questions?
All right. This one I will leave for you to try on your own. I'll put the answer in the in the notes before I post them, but I want to save a little bit of time and move on from this. It's, it's very similar to the last one. It's low. The only difference here is that what you'll notice is that O2, which is one of our reactants in this equation, appears both here and here. So you're not going to be able to use that to help you balance these. You're going to have to just look at the other reactant in the product and then work out ways to also cancel out intermediates. So maybe it's a little bit more complicated, but not too different than the last one. Like I said, I'll post the solution, but I want to move on so we can make sure we get to all the, all the stuff we have to do today. Now, as we saw in, this, in these examples with Hess's law, we can, you know, we can take any combination of equations and we can figure out how to combine them in different ways and get new delta H values for other equations. But it's not particularly systematic or convenient to always have to just take a bunch of random equations. Like the last example that we didn't do, you're using all these enthalpies involving strontium oxide and strontium carbonate to find the enthalpy for combusting carbon to make CO2, which is like a ridiculous way of doing it, right? So this is not like a very practical approach necessarily. So the approach that is more practical and is more systematic and the one that's more commonly used in, in sort of real chemistry analysis is to use what are called formation equations. These are very specific types of chemical equations that we can then combine to make whatever chemical equation we want and figure out the delta H. And the nice thing about formation equations is that all the values for formation enthalpies are tabulated for many, many different substances. And so with any combinations of substances as reactants and products, we can usually figure out what the delta H for that reaction would be just using their formation equations. But it is important that we define what a formation equation is. We're mostly just going to use the numerical values of delta H that are associated with these. But what a formation equation is, is a chemical equation. And what it shows is the formation of one mole of a compound. So it forms one mole of compound, and the reactants also are very specific. So there, it forms one mole of compounds uh, from, an el from the elements in their standard state. Okay? So one mole of compound will be the product, and the reactants are going to be elements in their standard states. So we'll talk to them in a second what it means to be in the standard states. But you have elements on the reactant side and one mole of a compound on the product side. Okay. One thing to keep in mind with formation equations is that fractional coefficients are okay on the reactant side because the important part is that the coefficient on the product side must be 1. So we have to put the coefficients on the reactant side that make that work out. So as you'll see, in many cases, you will have fractional coefficients on the reactant side because some of the elements in their standard state are polyatomic. So we'll see that that's going to be in many cases necessary to then use fractions to balance them. So this will all make more sense as we get through it, but fractional coefficients are okay. And so then the general form is that you have elements on the reactant side, uh, def you know, two or more elements, I should say, because it's never going to be one in most cases. And then you have one compound on the product side. Okay. So one, with the, one being the coefficient and that there's just one single compound. There's not going to be two products. It's all going to be just one. So that's what we mean by a formation equation. Okay. So that's how we identify them. Let's look at um, some other things related to this. So as I said, the reactants in a formation equation are elements in their standard states. So we need to know a little bit about what that means now. Um, so in their standard states, we have there's two things to consider, both the state of matter that we're talking about, whether it's a gas, liquid, or a solid as an element, um, and also then um, whether it's monoatomic, just a single atom by itself making up the, comp making up the substance, or whether it's a polyatomic, you know, diatomic or, or higher in some cases. So those are two things you have to know. And so um, the state of matter, will, will, you know, are gases, liquids, or solids. We're talking about the standard state being also at, you know, room temperature, 25, I think it's 25 degrees Celsius, and regular atmospheric pressure. So that's what we mean by standard conditions as well. So standard states are what the elements are, what form they're in at these conditions. So there are some elements that are gases, not a lot. So one category of gases, as you're likely aware of, are the noble gases. So all of the noble gases exist at, as gases and standard states. And those are just monoatomic. So it's just He, helium, Ne, neon, um, 
AR, argon, Xe, xenon, and so on. Okay, so the noble gases are just uh, monoatomic gases. That's that's pretty simple. But they also don't appear very often in formation equations because they don't react very much. But then other elements that are gases, which some of them you're, you should already be familiar with, would be hydrogen. Nitrogen and oxygen are both gases. They're what makes up the majority of our atmosphere. Um, and then two of the halogens are gases as well, fluorine and, and chlorine. And you'll see that, uh, and something that will make more sense later on in the course, is that you know, typically gases are non-metals. So the only, ga the only elements that appear as gases are non-metals. Um, and most of them, except for the noble gases, are diatomic. So H2, N2, O2, F2, Cl2. Those are the standard states for all these elements. So in a formation equation, if it involves nitrogen, it's going to be in the form of N2, not just N by itself. It's going to be N2 gas specifically. All right, there are only two elements in the whole world that occur as liquids in their standard states. So that's going to be bromine, which is one of the other halogens, also a diatomic Br2. And the only other element that appears as a liquid, which is kind of weird, but um, it is, is mercury HG. So it's a metal. Uh, you know, every other metal is a solid, but mercury is the one oddball that appears as liquid. If, um, if you've played with mercury before, be careful, but it is fun. Um, it, it's not going to kill you right away. People are a little bit too afraid of mercury. People used to drink it for indigestion, so um, not, not advisable, but it also doesn't kill you right away, so don't be, you know, but I wouldn't play with it too often either. All right, that's my chemical safety lesson of the day, but not, probably not a very good one in that case. Um, all right, and then every other element in the periodic table besides ones that I've listed is a solid, okay? So everything else, all of the metals are solids, and the rest of the nonmetals that aren't listed here, their standard states is solids, okay? We haven't talked a lot about states of matter, and it's not particularly important for this part to know the real details of this besides just know which elements are which. Now, there are some solids that are polyatomic, so again, the nonmetals typically form polyatomic molecular type uh, elements and so the other halogen I2 is also diatomic so all the halogens are diatomic F2, Cl2, Br2, I2 F2 and Cl2 are gases Br2 is a liquid, I2 is a solid they're all diatomic and then some other nonmetals that are polyatomic are phosphorus which is P4 so we saw P4 earlier today that is the standard state of phosphorus as an element and then sulfur and selenium which are group 6 elements are S8 and SE8, okay? So we do need to be familiar with the standard states of elements. As I said, most of them are monoatomic solids, so like all the metals on the periodic table except for mercury are solids and they're not polyatomic, they're just the metal by itself, Fe, Au for gold, whatever. So, uh, but some of these, as I said, are polyatomic, some of them are gases and liquids, and at least to be able to identify a formation equation, we need to be a little bit familiar with what the standard states of elements are, okay? So then um, once we have a formation equation, which has, again, elements in their standard states as reactants, a compound as a product, the enthalpy of formation is the enthalpy change associated with the formation equation. So if we write it out as a thermochemical equation, the enthalpy change would be called the enthalpy of formation. There we go. So the enthalpy change associated with a formation equation is called the enthalpy of formation. There is some terminology that's a little bit different that's sometimes called heat of formation. We know that heat and enthalpy are related, so that shouldn't be surprising to us. But if you see the term heat of formation, it doesn't mean anything different. It's the same thing as enthalpy of formation. And the abbreviation is it starts with delta H because it's enthalpy change, but then you have a little circle here that tells you that it's at standard conditions. You'll learn more about that in Chem 2. It basically, again, means room temperature and one atmosphere of pressure. And you put a little F there to tell you that it's a formation enthalpy, so that it specifically refers to a formation equation. So we it as delta H F. So sometimes you guys rebel when I ask you to think, but let's see if we can do it quickly here. Um, so what is the standard enthalpy? enthalpy of formation for an element in its standard state. Okay, So if you have an element in a standard state, we want to know what is delta H of formation for an element. What is that? All right, I heard a couple people say it, so I agree with zero as the right answer. So for any element, the delta H of formation is just zero. You don't have to have that given to you because every single element is zero. The reason is that 
Remember that the definition of a formation equation is the formation of a substance from an element in a standard state. So if we take hydrogen in a standard state and we want to do the formation equation for H2 gas, the formation equation for H2 gas is H2 gas going to H2 gas. There's no change. There's no chemical change, no physical change. So of course the delta H for this would be zero. So if there's no net reaction, if you're starting and ending with the same substance, that means there's no enthalpy change either. So for any element in a standard state, the delta H of formation is zero. Okay. So there are, you know, approximately 118 delta H of formation values that you have to memorize, which are all the elements which are zero. I think you guys can handle that. Um, so if you see, so if you see an element in one of these problems, the delta H of formation is zero. And don't have to worry about it anymore beyond that. All right. Every other one, there's no way to calculate it, so you have it has to be given to you if you need it for the problem. Okay. All right, so then let's see how we, uh, let's do one example of identifying formation equations before we move on to how we use these in enthalpy calculations. All right, so let's say we have uh, four answers here. We want to know which of the following represents a formation equation. So if we just go through them one by one, choice A, sodium oxide plus carbon dioxide equals sodium carbonate. It's a balanced equation, but is this a formation equation? No, and the reason why this one is not is because you can only have elements on the reactant side, and this one has two compounds on the reactant side. So unless you have elements on the reactant side, it cannot be a formation equation. If we go to number two here, or sorry, choice B, 2Na solid plus carbon solid plus 3 halves O2 gas going to sodium carbonate, does this look like a formation equation? All right, this one, um, yes, I, I saw a couple nods, and we have, again, elements, so sodium is a solid in a standard state, carbon is a solid, O2 gas is the standard state of oxygen, you'll get more familiar with these the more you see them, and we're forming one mole of compounds. So this one works as a formation equation. Looking at the other ones, let's see why these ones aren't. So if you look at choice C here, choice C is just doubling, cho is just doubling choice B, but remember that a formation equation can only have a coefficient of one on the product side. This has a coefficient of two, so this one's not going to be a formation equation because we need to have only one mole of compound form. So these require one mole of compound as a product. So this illustrates what I said earlier, which is that in many cases, valid formation equations will have fractional coefficients. That's okay. There's nothing wrong with that. We can get rid of the fraction by doubling it, but then it's no longer a formation equation. Okay? And then finally, if we look at the last one here, this one has elements on the reactant side, but we see that oxygen is by itself is just O, whereas the standard state of oxygen is O2. So if it's going to be a formation equation, it needs to be as O2. So the elements need to be in their standard states for these to work. Standard with a D, not standard. Standard states. And so that's not a standard state for oxygen, so that's not a formation equation. All right, so that gives you an idea of how to identify in some of the definitions associated with formation equations. Now, the real use of these, the real reason why we care about these is that if we have delta H of formations, formation enthalpies for every single reactant and product, we can calculate delta H for the reaction very easily. And it's really, it is an application of Hess's law. So it really is what we're doing here is we're taking all these formation equations and adding them together in different ways to get the overall equation. But we don't necessarily have to do all those steps this time because there's a general mathematical equation that evolves from all of this. So if we want to find the delta H for any reaction, we just take the sum of all the delta H's of formation for the products. And I'll put a coefficient here just to remind us that there are coefficients involved in many cases. So delta H formation for products. And we subtract the sum of the delta H's of formation for reactants multiplied by their coefficients. All right, so this looks a lot like another equation that we saw in chapter three, which was using bond energies to find delta E or delta H technically. Um, which, but in that one, it was reactants minus products. This time it's products minus reactants when we're using delta H formation. That's because bond energy and delta H formation have different definitions. So when you work out the math, it ends up reversing. So don't be confused by that, but it's a relatively simple equation. So again, the sigma here is, that's Greek letter sigma, which means sum so we're adding up all the delta H's of formation on each side and before subtracting. 
and then these m and n co are just reaction coefficients. All right, and the reason we need to account for coefficients is because delta H of formation is for one mole of substance. So if the coefficient is anything other than one, you have to multiply the delta H of formation by that coefficient. Remember, as we talked about earlier, if you double the coefficient, you double delta H. So it's the same story here. If you have a delta H of formation for one mole of substance, but you have something other than one mole of substance, you have to make sure you modify the delta H by that same amount. And as we said before, if you have an element, one or more elements that are involved, the delta H formation is going to be zero, so you don't need to account for those at all. We can just ignore them, basically. Elements in their standard state, specifically. All right, so any of the elements that are reactants or products, they would just be zeros in this equation and can be effectively left out. Okay? So that's how we do it, then. If we have delta H formation for everything, we can just calculate delta H for reaction. All right? So let's look at an example here for combustion of methane. So if we burn CH4 to make CO2 in water, let's determine what the delta H is for this reaction. And what we've given you here is the delta H of formation for the reactant CH4, the product CO2, and the product water. So those are all given to us. And so the delta H of formation is going to be, or sorry, delta H of reaction is what we're looking for. It's going to be the sum of the delta H's of formation for the products multiplied by their coefficients minus the sum of delta H's of formation of reactants. And like I said, if we really wanted to, we could write out all the formation equations. We could figure out how to rearrange them, you know, flip them and multiply the coefficients, whatever, and add them all together to get this equation here. But that's a lot of extra work. Whereas if we're using all formation enthalpies, delta H formation, delta H formation for all of them, it's just this mathematical equation here. We don't have to write out all the individual chemical steps. All right, so what we get is then on the product side, we're forming one mole of CO2. So we're going to use the delta H formation for CO2. We're forming two moles of water, so we have two moles of water times the delta H of formation for water. Then we're going to subtract from that the reaction side. So on the reaction side, we have one mole of methane. We're going to use its delta H of formation. And we have two moles of oxygen and the delta H of formation of oxygen. Now, which of these do we already know? without having to look it up. So we have O2 gas. What's the delta H formation for O2 gas? It's an element, so it's going to be zero. So we can get rid of that term, basically. So then putting in the numbers that are left, we have one mole of CO2. The delta H formation for CO2 is minus 393.5 kilojoules per mole. So typically, delta H formation is kilojoules per mole. And then we have also two moles of water as a product, so it's going to be two moles times the delta H formation of water. All right, delta H formation of water is given to us as minus 241.8. All right, so that's the product side, and then all that's left in the reactant side is to subtract one times the delta H formation of CO2. Or sorry, CH4 is the reactant, which is minus 74.9. All right, so the only thing that can usually trick you up here is signs. So make sure you don't leave out any minus signs from the delta H of formation values, and make sure you're doing products minus reactants, so don't forget about that minus sign there. All right, so it's pretty simple math. Just make sure you keep the signs straight, and what we get is minus 802.2 kilojoules. So again, that would be the amount of heat that's released when we burn one mole of methane, and here we calculated it using known delta H formation values. All right, so any questions on that? All right, I will also leave this one for you to try on your own, um, so I want to make sure I get to the end stuff here, so I'll write out the answer of the solution, um, you know, how to do it in the notes before I post them, but this one is similar to the last one, a few more substances involved. Um, the only thing to keep in mind here is that we notice that
one of our reactants is an element phosphorus, but is not in a standard state. Standard state of phosphorus is P4. Here we're using a different, what's called allotrope of phosphorus, which is red phosphorus. P4 is called white phosphorus based on their colors. So if you have an element that's not in a standard state, it will also have a delta H formation associated with it, so you can't ignore it in that case. So be aware of that when you do this problem. But other than that, it's really the same set types of steps that we just did, taking reactants, or sorry, products minus reactants with all the tabulated delta H's of formation given to you directly. Now the last thing I want to cover, which is the last thing that your book does in chapter two, or sorry, chapter seven, is a little bit of information about you know, fuels and sort of what, you know, what's really the importance of enthalpy. And I guess especially since we live in Houston, it's probably good that we cover some of this stuff, given that there's so much fuel production that goes on here. Um, and there's a lot of, you know, information in the book. There's, you know, several pages to read that you could go through. Um, what I want to try to do here is sort of condense it into the essential elements that you know kind of what we expect you to, to understand, what we, expect, what we expect you to know about this. And I think this is some, it, there's some interesting stuff here because it helps put us a little bit into context some of the things that we've just learned. Because I know sometimes in general chemistry courses it's not obvious what, you know, what we're learning, whether it has any importance or not. I promise you that it does, but I think in this case it's pretty apparent. So the importance of enthalpy is that it, it's a really key determinant in, in fuel chemistry. So what exactly is a fuel? It's a substance that has a lot of stored energy that you can release by burning. Now there are other ways of releasing the stored energy in fuels. You can do it um, electrochemically, which is called a fuel cell. But that's something more advanced than we'll get to. Uh, but generally what you do is you release the stored energy by burning the fuel. All right, we've seen a lot of combustion reactions already. And we've seen our, today a couple examples where they have very negative delta H values. So when you burn a fuel, so the one we just did with methane, CH4, methane is a fuel, which is the, the main component of natural gas. When you burn a fuel, you are releasing a lot of energy. You have a very negative delta H. And so that's, then you use that energy that you release to do some sort of work or, or you know, use the heat that you generate to do something as well. So that's where the importance of you know, fuel is, is really directly tied to enthalpy changes associated with burning. So the different types of fuels that we have, the vast majority that we use these days are called fossil fuels. And these are formed by the decomposition of organisms, you know, living organisms over many, many thousands or millions of years, okay? So fossil fuels are made up of mostly, as we'll see, carbon and some other elements as well. Carbon and hydrogen are the two most common elements of fossil fuels, but they're decomposed over millions of years. So they take a long time to form, and then we dig them out of the ground and use them. So most of the fuels that we use today are fossil fuels. So gasoline, coal, natural gas, all of those things are t primarily derived from fossil fuel sources, and they're you know the, a big driver of the economy here in Houston. Obviously, are fossil fuels. Okay, so that's what we mean by fossil fuels. It's anything that you know you dig out of the ground, which is formed from decomposition of living matter over many many years. All right, so there are a few different types of fossil fuels. The, the two major types that I've already mentioned are petroleum and coal. So petroleum is mostly made up of hydrocarbons. which are, again, C and H are the two primary elements in there. So CH, CX, HY, some ratio of carbon and hydrogen. Petroleum, uh, most is, is dug out of the ground typically as a liquid. And it has a lot of different components to it. So it's, you know, it's mostly hydrocarbons, a few other things in there. But the types of hydrocarbons are, are expansive. There's tons of them in there. It's a huge mixture. And so what a big part of the petroleum industry involved with is separating petroleum into its most valuable and most useful fractions. So some of the most valuable fractions that you get from petroleum are gasoline, which you of course fill your car with, diesel if you uh, are one of those people that thinks that diesel fuel is superior, you might have a diesel car of your own or, or if you drive a large truck, those are usually diesel. Jet fuel is another fraction and many others. And really the only difference between these different types of fuels is just the size of the molecules that are involved. So they're they're all they're all even these are sort of mixtures. They're not they're not pure substances. But you know, gasoline has you know a lot of um, carbon hydrocarbons that have around eight carbon atoms in them or so. It's pretty high in octane, as we said. Diesel is a little bit heavier. It's going to have usually like C10 to C12. So 10 or 12 carbons is sort of the average 
uh, size, and then jet fuel is even heavier than that. So really it's the size of the hydrocarbon molecules that dictates these different fractions and that dictates their, some of their burning properties, which is why they have different applications. But petroleum, as I said, is mainly a, sep uh, a, a mixture of these hydrocarbons. Now there are other chemical products that aren't burned as fuels that come out of that as well. So a lot of the plastics that we use for everything today those precursors are also derived from petroleum resources and then used to make plastic. So petroleum has a lot of other uses besides just fuels, but fuels is the big money maker and you know, plastics being sort of a, a secondary thing as well is very important also. The other major fossil fuel is called coal. This is mostly made up of carbon, so it has some other elements in it, but it's primarily carbon, so it's a lot more carbon rich. And it's solid, um, so it looks a lot like a rock basically if you've seen it before. They do have variable carbon content, so depending on where you get the coal from, um, you know, again, these are formed over millions of years, and depending on the exact conditions and timescales that they form at, they're gonna have different amounts of carbon in them, so not all coal is created equally. And your book goes through sort of a lot of different classifications of coal. You have like anthracite, and I'm probably forgetting all the rest of them. I don't, we don't need you guys to know the names of them, but the concept that you should be familiar with is that the more carbon that you have in the coal, you have more stored energy. So if you're burning two different types of coal, if one of them is more carbon rich than the other, you will release more energy for the one that has more carbon in it. The reason is because remember when you burn something and we burn carbon in particular, you're making CO2 as your product. So coal that already has some oxygen in it is already sort of partially burned. You've already released some of the energy from that. And so when you want to convert carbon to CO2, the more pure carbon you have, the more energy you release when you convert it to CO2 and burn it. All right, so the higher the carbon percentage, the more stored energy you have. We don't need you to worry about the different names of these different types of coals, but they are distinguished from each other by the carbon content, and the carbon content then dictates how energetic those fuels are. Now, there are some concerns about fossil fuels. So obviously, if you follow the news these days, you're likely aware of these. And the big one is uh, you know, the concern about the different greenhouse gases that are released when you burn fossil fuels. So common greenhouse gases include you know, water vapor is a greenhouse gas, uh, methane itself is a greenhouse gas, but then carbon dioxide, which is formed by burning fossil fuels, is itself known to be a greenhouse gas. These trap heat um, and And what they can, and these are actually important, you know, we, we need some greenhouse gases because without them the earth would cool down to an uninhabitable temperature. So these greenhouse gases that are present, they keep their surface warm. So we wouldn't be able to live here if it wasn't for them. Um, but there's some concern these days that as we continue to increase the greenhouse gas concentration in the atmosphere by continually burning fossil fuels, that we're going to warm the earth unnaturally. And that, that's a topic that's way too complex for me to get into in this course. Um, both the scientific and sort of the you know geopolitical aspects of global warming and climate change and all that is not something that I want to discuss with you in this course, but we should be aware of this as, as a concern about greenhouse gases that they may warm the earth unnaturally or lead to other unexpected consequences that, you know, again, this is all very recent earth history that we're t dealing with here. So regardless of whether, you know, however the science or the predictions end up panning out, it's really only the last hundred years of our existence that we've been burning massive amounts of fossil fuels for, for energy. So it's still too, probably too early in the game to really know like, what's going to happen because climate, these climate events can happen over many, many thousands of years, and we're only talking about a very small slice of that, that we've actually been doing this stuff. So again, it's a complex topic that I want to get into, but there are concerns about this. And there's also, regardless of whether this you know, climate change ends up uh, panning out or not or, or becoming a huge issue, uh, which there are different schools of thought on that. But the long-term viability of fossil fuels is, is also not there because, as we said, fossil fuels take millions and year, of years to generate, and we use them much faster than that. Um, so these fossil fuels won't last forever. There's not an immediate pressing concern that we're going to run out anytime soon in our lifetimes. But there are forecasts that say in the next few hundred years or so, we're going to get to a point where our reserves of fossil fuels are dwindling to a point that's going to start impacting us. So there's concerns as well about how long these things will last because they take millions of years to replenish. So we can't burn fossil fuels today and then, you know, 10 years from now, just dig it back out of the earth. It's not going to be there in that time scale. So uh, we have to be concerned about that as well, that eventually they're going to run out. Um, 
And as you know, technologies develop, we are able to harvest more and more of them from the ground. So the protect protections from where, from where we're going to run out keep kind of stepping progressively further and further in, into the future, but they're not going to go on forever. At some point, there's going to be a concern where we've dwindled our reserves and have to start relying on other things. So that brings me to then the last topic that I want to cover, which is, you know, what are some ways of storing and using energy in the future? What are some alternative fuel sources that we could certainly develop? And these remain very, uh, you know, important research topics in this very day. So one that's been, uh, you know, thought about a lot is using hydrogen as a fuel. Um, so hydrogen has very high energy density from a, from a weight standpoint. So hydrogen is very light. It's the lightest element on the periodic table, as you know. But when you burn hydrogen, you get a lot of energy out of it. So you have, you know, if you take H2 and you combust it with oxygen to make water, the delta H for this is, we already saw this number earlier today, minus 286 kilojoules. So for one mole of hydrogen, you get 286 kilojoules of energy. Remember that one mole of hydrogen only weighs two grams. So it's a very energy dense fuel from a mass standpoint. So a very small amount of hydrogen gives you a lot of energy when you burn it in terms of mass. So that's attractive, but there's some drawbacks of hydrogen as well, which is that it's currently expensive to produce hydrogen. And most of the, in the, in the cheapest ways to make hydrogen today involve fossil fuels anyway, so you're not really benefiting anything there by generating hydrogen from fossil fuels and then burning it. Um, there are, you, there, you know, there's a lot of research going on to generate hydrogen from water, and if we could get that to work efficiently, that would be a nice way of doing it, because then you don't generate any waste products. You basically use water to make hydrogen, and then you burn it back to get water back, so it's sort of a closed cycle. That would be great, but it's too expensive to do that right now. Um, so there's some issues there. And then the other problem with hydrogen, if you follow history at all, you remember the Hindenburg disaster, um, which was a hydrogen balloon, hydrogen blimp. Hydrogen is difficult and dangerous to store and transport. All right, because it is a gas, it is extremely flammable, and it's hard to compress it. So even though it has good what's called gravimetric energy density, meaning that the energy per mass is very high, the energy per volume is very small because you can't compress it very well because it's a gas. So, you know, uh, to, to have, if you were to, you know, wanna, if you wanted to make a hydrogen car, for example, the amount of hydrogen that you need to have in your car to be able to, to run it for, you know, two or 300 miles bef before a fill up would be just huge in terms of volume. It would be a small mass of hydrogen, so it would be lightweight, but you need heavy storage tanks to compress it. And even when you compress it to a safe level, you know, you still have a huge volume of that. So there's some difficulties with hydrogen. So liquid fuels are still largely viewed as desirable because they're easier to store and transport. They're safer than hydrogen in a lot of respects. But as I said, most liquid fuels are, are fossil fuel based. So to get away from that, there's a lot of effort also in biofuels. So these are fuels that are produced from plant matter um, and they're, they're generated on a much faster time scale than you know, oil and, and uh, coal are generated. So they're using you know, artificial chemical processes to extract fuels, usually from plant matter, um, so like you've probably heard of corn ethanol and there's other, you know, grass based technologies for getting fuels and, and chemicals out of biomass. So this has, you know, made a little bit of a dent in the in the global energy market. It's not totally um, useless to do this, but it's still a pretty small percentage of fuels are generated by, by biofuel approaches, and there's still a lot of development that needs to happen for this to become more realistic. But some common examples of biofuels would be, you can make methanol biologically. So methanol is, a, is an alcohol that also releases a lot of energy when it burns, but it's a liquid, so it's a little bit safer to handle than hydrogen. Um, ethanol, which, you know, these days, most gasoline that you buy has ethanol in it because there are biofuel tax incentives that these um, you know, oil companies are basically making bioethanol and putting it into their fuels to get a tax break. Um, so whether that's good or not, I guess, is another question. But um, ethanol is already used a lot. It's a, it, you can make it from biofuel sources. And then there's a thing called seed oil where you know, a heavier oil that you can get from seeds of certain plants that will also burn and release heat and, and sort of is another sort of alternative fuel source generated from biomass. So that kind of just summarizes some of the key points. You can read about it more in the book if you want to. You'll see the homework questions are pretty basic. Um, next time we will cover, we'll circle back to chapter three and cover what's called born haber cycles, very much related to this stuff. And then we'll move on to gas laws uh, very soon after that.